for, uh, for that introduction. I hope I do I do justice for everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, I pre I prepared some slides, but I won't follow them line by line. They're mainly for facts, but then we we'll try to have a discussion. Um, I'm also cognizant that I, I don't know it all. And many of you who are in the different businesses know much, much more. And hopefully we can discuss with one another, have a discourse and hopefully help that person who is looking for some information, for some knowledge, or who wants to make a certain decision about their business. Um, yes, I've been introduced. I, I work with Citibank. I don't get scared that I, I, I don't know the economy of, of, of the country and the businesses. That is my work job. But in, in my private life, I am very uh, passionate and grounded about trying to know how businesses work in Uganda and how we can be better as a country. So let's try to see, let's discuss from that perspective, the things definitely that I might not be well conversant with, but I try to keep my ears to the ground. So in my presentation, I tried to break it down. I tried to break down, of course, the budget is going to be read today. There are certain things that I in here that might not necessarily be what are read out today, but based on the indicators that have been put across over the last few months, and they give us an indication of what the budget will be like. So I've broken my presentation both from uh, an economic perspective, macroeconomic, and then of course, from the perspective of government revenue, that is the taxes, and how those impact us as businesses. And hopefully along those lines, we will be able to get a good, a good discourse that will help all of us. I would like to start from here um, on the spot. What is, Peter, is it? Is it possible to put it in presentation mode? I think currently. Okay. Oh, okay. You know, sometimes Zoom doesn't. Okay. Is that better for everybody? Yeah, that's better. That's much better. Thank you. Okay. I wanted to start from the spot. Where are we today as, a, as an economy and for businesses? And I want to note that from a business perspective, our economy remains fragile. Uh, we've not been in a good space over the last two years, and that can be seen on a couple of indicators that we're going to read through. I don't need to belabor this point. Most of you are in business and you've seen how tough it has been. You've seen people saying business is tough, business is tough, things are tough, you are a staff on us. So it's not been easy and it's just at that point in time where it's beginning to get better. So right currently, the central bank, central bank lending rate, the CBR is that central, like a benchmark rate is at 10%. A few years back, this used to be at about 7, 7.5. But because of the difficult economic environment over the last three years, we've seen it go up and up, and it's about 10%. Just to be able to manage other aspects of the economy, that is inflation um, uh, and 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 the ability for us to manage private sector credit. Currently, we are seeing the economy rebound uh, from a very difficult time it has been at in the last two, two years. Currently, we are averaging growth of about 6.8%. And the projection in the national budget for 2023-2024 is about 6%. We are happy to see growth happening in the economy, coming back in the economy. And that means that for our businesses, we are likely to see more demand for our business in, in our businesses and probably be, make better revenues. But having said that, what the last three years have taught us as people is that nothing is cast in stone. What you think is going to be a good year can easily become a bad year. Um, 
nobody expected COVID, nobody expected the Ukraine war, Russia Ukraine war to happen immediately. Nobody expected some of these big shocks that we have seen in the economy over the last few, few months. Nobody expected that bank, two banks, a, a big bank in Europe and a relatively mid-sized big bank in the US will go down in the last one year. So sometimes uh, uh, what the last three years have told us is that sometimes you can't project the economy as you would have loved to. But there is uh, a general feel that the economy is getting better and heading into 2024, we should see things getting better for not just for the country, but also for the businesses that operate in the country. One of the things that has been fantastic over the last few months is um, our our Ugandan currency. Over the last one month, when the anti-homosexuality bill was being debated, one of my biggest fears was that the Uganda shilling will touch 4,000 shillings and uh, there will be a lot of losses for businesses. I, I was, the last, the last time we had the anti-homosexuality bill about eight years ago, I'll never forget that day where I used to work over two nights, we made a loss of about $500,000 because of the shock uh, we experienced when this bill was put in place. But this time around, there was a bit of volatility in the exchange rate, but it stabilized quickly, um, which shows that the economy is a bit resilient to some of these big shocks and it's better placed than it was a couple of years when such as such news would make the economy very volatile and make it difficult for businesses to know what to do in a spate of time. When we look at how you people have been borrowing money from banks, from financial institutions, generally we can all say that the, the interest rates are not very good. Lending rates have been rising. I mean, if we are if looking at the, the last Bank of Uganda report, on average, banking uh, lending rates rose to 20.5% from about 20.2% at the end of last year, meaning that for businesses, it's still very expensive for us to borrow. You can imagine if somebody wants to make a return that is greater than 20%, the borrowing money at 20%, uh, 20.5% and you want to make a return that will enable you to pay back the bank loan, but also take care of all your other costs as a business. That can be problematic if the rates keep rising. And the banks are saying that it's also problematic for them because they have to pass on the refinancing cost, the cost at which they're getting the money to be able to pass it on to everybody. So. We are, we are looking at people borrowing at 19.23% if you're borrowing in Uganda shillings up from 18.54. In the on the F1, if you're borrowing in dollars, you're borrowing at 7.96% up from 7.93%. So that is not a good borrowing environment if you're in business. Um, I, 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 in, in my private life, I also am part of a, of a circle and I oversee uh, how much people are borrowing. And most of the, for, for this circle, most of the people who borrow are borrowing for, they have, they have SMEs, they have, they have small businesses. Over the last four or five months, we've seen a big struggle for businesses to borrow because uh, people are wondering if I borrow, I, I add this borrow, borrowing onto my book, how sure am I that I will have enough business, generate enough business for me to be able to pay off the loan well. And we've seen that struggle, whether you're in a, when you're, whether you're a micro borrower or you're a macro borrower, if you're borrowing big money, it's like the ones you borrow from organizations like Citibank, you find you found that that credit demand has been difficult. And that can be seen here. Um, Private sector credit growth has been moderate for most of the first half of the year. Uh, we've seen credit extensions fall 
from about 4.84 trillion to about 4.44 trillion. Also, the ability for financial institutions to recover their money that they've lent out falling from 4.3 trillion to 3.9 trillion. And that indicates that businesses are stressed. One, they don't want to take on more credit. Two, they are struggling even with the credit that they have. Yeah, importantly to note here is that credit demand has also slowed down. For businesses that are into manufacturing, that are into building, are into construction, and are into real estate, there's been a slowdown in credit demand because uh, people are not certain whether they will be able to pay back those loans or will they be able to, uh, yeah, if, if, if be able to not be able to ensure not that they will not lose their properties. I mean, you've seen recent cases. Those are coming from way back, those are shocks from earlier years, but that also kind of uh, um, shapes how people look at credit and demand credit. The interest rates, we've seen them fall over the last few months as government has been very keen to borrow externally, which is a good thing for us as businesses when interest rates, especially for government securities are falling. It simply means that government is not crowding out the private sector from borrowing from banks. However, we've seen some volatility in the short-term borrowing for government. We've seen it volatile a bit. And we are also, in the next two, three weeks, four weeks, we are not certain that interest rates will go down. In fact, yesterday, I was speaking with a few colleagues of mine and they were noting that the interest rates are going to go up because government doesn't have money. And the market is beginning to note and say, government, you don't have money and you need to close there. And if you want money, if you want my money, you're going to pay higher. So we've just seen that a small trend towards the end of the financial year where interest rates have decided to start climbing up because the people who have money are now beginning to price it more expensively to government because they know government definitely is desperate and it needs the money. The other bit on inflation, we have seen it drop. Um, I mean, case in point is your fuel price. What I was getting for 200,000 last year, same time, compared to what I'm getting today for 200,000, there's a very big difference. We have seen, for those of you who are accountants like me, with, who are very happy to see the, the fuel price loss, the five, I mean, drop from the 5,000 mark and come back at least to 4,999. Psychologically, it makes you feel better, but it can also be seen in the research numbers that inflation peaked sometime last year, uh, around June, July, around June, May, it was at its maximum. And since then, it has been going down. And Bank of Uganda is projecting that a come Q1 2024, we should be back to their target of about 5%. So uh, for, for a business that will bring some respite, some of the high costs of production that we've been struggling with over the last one and a half years, we are going to see them drop. Things like transport costs, we are likely to see them drop. Uh, the pressure from your employees around their money, not their money being less than the month, slightly dropping down as foodstuffs become cheaper, fuel becomes cheaper, utility prices become cheaper. I'm sure one of the biggest, biggest conversations as business owners you've had over the last one and a half years is from employees saying that the month is much, much bigger than the money that is being given. And you couldn't blame them because inflation was biting hard and uh, people could not, could not make ends meet. I stay on the, on the, on the Nigeria, Chiwatule, Chida axis, and you could tell there's a time when cars were really few on the road. You could imagine people are struggling to put fuel into their cars. But as this has eased down, we have, we've begun to see more Subarus on the road um, as people now can afford fuel as inflation begins to, to drop. So that is on the spot today. What 
what where is the business at today? Yeah, so focusing a little bit into what the budget promises for us for 2023, 2024. I'll just note a few highlights here that uh, we expect the budget is at about 52.74. It's rising from 48.13 last year. How are we financing it as a country? Domestic revenues, budget support, uh, domestic borrowing, interest payments, and local government revenue. We shall get a bit in detail on that. The nominal debt to GDP fell slightly from uh, from 53.1% to 52.4%. But this the drop was mainly attributed to inflation. It wasn't necessarily because we were much, much better. It's apparently because that our GDP really grew much, much bigger than our debt. It was mainly because of inflation. So that that doesn't really say much in, in how we are managing our, our debt. Real GDP growth, I've mentioned, it's anticipated about 6%. And this is going to be driven mainly by the service sector and the expansion of the industry sector. We have beginning, the, the service sector is beginning to grow again to, if you talk about tourism, talk about uh, some, of, or some of the services that are being provided, whether they are professional services. These are beginning to grow a bit from where they were about two years ago. Right? If you're in the service industry about one and a half years ago, most of the people I knew who were in the service industry, they had their salaries cut just to manage through the difficult, the difficult times. But now those are beginning to get back to where they used to be because there's some expanse in the economy. There is a, there's also this anticipation that the industry sector is growing. Though slow, there's growth in the manufacturing subsector. Uh, one, one of the things that taught us during COVID that import, importing stuff and saying that your business is run around importation is not sustainable. And many Ugandans are becoming wiser in trying to open up small manufacturing cottages. And those are being seen in our economy and they are, they are, they are sparring growth in the economy. Uh, there is this, this bit. Uh, uh, I'm not political, but I don't know how how, how factual it is. I know it's in our it's in our budget. We are, we are saying that economic growth is also, is also going to be spurred by PDM and Emioga. I'd want to hear from people here on the, on the line. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical about it, but I'm 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 very I'm very positive about the fact that there's going to be a pickup in the oil sector construction activities. Uh, that will impact economic growth and also the pickup in regional trade and expected rebound in agricultural activities. These are expected to help the, the budget in, I mean, to help the economy in 2023-2024 to become, to become bigger. We, when we look at the working age population, it is estimated at about 23 million of the total population. And these are the people between the ages of 14 to 64. Uh, the statistics show that many are involved in some form of work, but we, we all can agree that most of, of the working population in Uganda is underemployed. And then, then we are not maximizing people's full potential to add to the economy. And that is something for us as business owners here to work together, I think, with government to ensure that the working age population is not being underemployed but it's, um, it's, it's being utilized to its full potential. Uh, we see many graduates every year graduating, and that's why you find that in Uganda, as businesses, we get away with paying people low salaries because the supply of labor is much higher than the demand for labor. So what, in a nutshell, I'm saying that the economy, the domestic economy continues to recover. Uh, for many businesses, it can only get better. We've, We've seen the worst over the last two to three years. It can only get better. 2024 looks better. And as a business owner, we should look, we should look forward to it. Public debt, uh, there's a lot of, of talk about our public debt. It keeps increasing. 
2020 has increased to 20.98 billion. Uh, sorry, from 20.98 billion do, billion dollars to about 21.74 billion dollars, which is about 80.7 trillion. Uh, which also means that our the money we need to service the country's debt is also going up. It has increased by about 2.1 trillion Uganda shillings. And what are we saying? Yeah, is that we are saying that the country is still committing a lot of its revenue to pay back its loans. Though what we can note is that the total public debt remains sustainable. I mean, if you compare it to even countries like Japan, Japan, the, the debt to GDP ratio is about 140%. So the debt is much higher than uh, the GDP. However, what those countries have that we don't have is that they create enough revenue to be able to pay off their debt. So my comment is that though not alarming in real terms, debt is always better managed if the country has substantive revenues. And it's questionable whether Uganda generates enough revenue to comfortably watch its debt servicing bill increase. Stay, it, it, it's sustainable, but the challenge is that we don't create enough revenues that will give you that comfort to say that we, we are creating enough revenues for us to pay off our debt and still be able to take care of other things that we have, other needs that we have as a country. Uh, and, and, and this can be seen, I mean, when we see the, the, the struggle we have with infrastructure, especially in the districts that create most of our GDP. The districts that create most of our GDP are Kampala, Wakiso, Mukono, creating over 80% of our, of our GDP in the country. But we still find that the infrastructure that supports that GDP is still poor, as seen when rains come, seen when the potholes come, and 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 we are, we are we are asking ourselves where's the money to do these roles and make them and government is saying we don't have money we we have a lot of commitments to 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 take care of and that impacts the businesses because the businesses then struggle to the cost of, of running a business the cost of operations of a business within these districts that create most of the gdp for the country becomes quite exorbitant and and, and quite difficult for us. You find that then the cost of production become quite high and it's difficult for them to be priced to customers and you remain competitive. And also what it means is that when we have this big debt financing that we have to do, it puts pressure on interest rates because at a certain point in time, you see supplementary budgets being passed. These need money. Where is government going to get this money from? Chances are they might be disciplined for nine months, but then towards the end of the year, they still come back to banks or to people that have liquidity like NSSF. And these banks and NSSF know that uh, the demand is high and the risk is, so they price in that demand and the rates go up. And when the rates go up, what happens is that then you who owns a business, it becomes a little bit harder for you to borrow money sensibly from a financial institution. On the budget, revenue and expenditure, domestic revenues are expected to be about 28 trillion, but yeah, 28.8 billion shillings. Uh, 28, sorry, 28, yeah, about 28 trillion, which is about 13%, uh, 13.8% 13 of GDP. And this is growing from 25.55. 20.25 20 25 billion, 25, 25.55 trillion. On the expenditure side uh, and net lending, we are projected to spend about 37 trillion, uh, which is slightly lower than what we are projected to spend in the current year. We are projected to spend 37.5 trillion in 2022, 2023 compared to 37.2 trillion that we project to spend in the next financial year. How do we, how are we going to fund this? Uh, partly uh, about 8.4 trillion 
is going to be external financing, uh, of which 2.5 trillion will be uh, finan financing, a budget, fin budget financing loans. Those are the loans that finance our budget, the one I mentioned earlier. And then about 6 trillion will be used as project financing for the various projects that we have. Government is committed to lowering domestic borrowing. In 2024, they want domestic borrowing to be at about 1.6 trillion. Currently in this year, we are already at about five, about five trillion. For those in importation, we are saying about a importation of about 15.5 trillion happened in the first half of financial year 2022, 2023. This still speaks to the fact that although there's a lot of activity around increasing the manufacturing space, a lot of a lot of the running of the economy is based on imports. So what are we saying here? We are saying that with if government remains committed to borrowing less from the domestic market, then we are saying that that will be good for us as businesses because it means that. They, they, they are not going to crowd out the private sector from accessing credit. And if they can't crowd out the private sector from accessing credit, then the financial institutions will drop interest rates and we will be able to borrow at better rates. Of course, the biggest question we always have as a country is that does government have the ability to maintain and discipline itself? In most cases that we've seen over the last few years is that at a certain point, they can't help themselves. <clears throat> uh, budgets come up, uh, supplementary budgets come up, and when those ones begin to come up, you find that they are hard pressed on the wall and they have to borrow. Also, we would seen over the last six months, one of the cry from the private sector has been the inability for government to pay for the contracts that government has gotten into. Um, government is still the biggest uh, spender in our economy. And when government is not paying the private sector, we feel it in the economy. Uh, there's been a lot of effort by the PS to, to make payments uh, over the last few, few months. But as you can imagine, the private sector it's not enough for the private sector. The private sector wants to see most of, or not, or in fact, all of their, of their, of their, of their, all of their receivables being paid off. So this also has an impact on, on, on the economy. If government is not in a position to pay uh, uh, its suppliers on time. I also wanted to mention something on reserves and current account. Our international reserves, reserves meaning the amount of dollars that we are holding as reserves. This dropped from about 4.3 trillion that last year to about 3.6 trillion. So about, yeah, about 3.6 in November, 2022. This, is, uh, this helps us to manage uh, shocks, especially around ethics. So if the reserves keep dropping, then you wonder whether in the certain future, we will have the ability to fight uh, for the strength of our shilling. It's important for our shilling to have some level of strength. There's a widening deficit in Bank of Uganda's current account. Uh, this is as a result of the overall balance of payments deficit. So we are simply saying here that we are spending more to, to bring in goods into the country compared to, to, the, to the reverse. And importantly here to note for us as businesses is the tax revenue. The tax revenue as a percentage of GDP is about 12.9%. This is still below the World Bank advice minimum of 15%. And what does this mean for us as businesses? We are saying like, like Uganda, like any other country in Sub-Saharan Africa, our tax to GDP level is still less than ideal. 
you find that for a country of 50 million Ugandans, maybe about four or three million Uganda, Ugandans are paying taxes. So the tax base is narrow, small, uh, and therefore we are not able to meet a certain standard for us to say our economy is collecting enough tax revenues to manage it. What does this mean? It means that the few of you, the businesses that that are trying to put systems in place, are trying to be orderly, you're going to see more pressure from the Ghana Revenue Authority as they try to collect more revenues. Uh, if you're going to see more digitization of revenue collection, uh, we've seen stories over the last few weeks. IFRIS has become IFRIS, uh, and if you're yeah, and, and a lot of and a lot of effort is being put in place to straighten systems to ensure that there's no tax tax leakage. Ledger balancing has become ledger balancing. Tax audits have become tax audits. There is less empathy from it from for a taxpayer from the Uganda Revenue Authority as they try to bridge the revenue gaps. And unfortunately, also that leads into controversial interpretation of tax clauses. Now, when, the, when, there is, when, when there are controversial interpretation of tax clauses, it takes away business confidence. It takes away the investor confidence. And that is crucial for all of us. Uh, people might say, okay, we, the small business owners, the Ugandans, we are used to how Uganda works. But you don't operate in a vacuum. You operate with other businesses. So if there are bigger investors who have a fear of the tax tax regime, and they're holding back on how much investment they can put in place. That is not good for all of us. It, it creates uh, it creates trouble. So there's always that fear from all of us as a, as investors uh, that uh, we might we might be on the wrong side of the zeal of the revenue authority to collect more money. But it's also important for us to be alert these days. Gone are the days where we could just uh, try to dodge taxes, try to uh, feed it around with our numbers. You've seen people being arrested. Uh, we saw Indians being arrested for, for manufacturing invoices. So it's important for us as business owners to, sp to, to spend more money or to, to put more attention on, uh, on how we manage our tax affairs because this is not about to go away. Um, it's not about to go away, it's going to become stronger. And I just wanted to make a comment here. I know we are crying. We keep crying that uh, URA has become URA and taxes have become taxes. It's not only to Uganda. If you look around all these sub-Saharan African countries, the, the pressure is on because there's a desire from these big the World Banks, the IMF, to see that our countries grow our tax base, that we reach the minimum they are setting for us of tax to GDP ratio of about 15%. If you look at our neighbors in Kenya this year, they are crying. They've had unprecedented amounts of tax bills that have been put before their parliament. So it could it could easily be worse. Let's try to deal with what we have in Uganda and hopefully um, also the people who set policies see the outcry of businesses in the country and do the right thing. So basically that's the view on, on the economic side of what we expect come 2024 and the likely impact it's going to have on us as, uh, as business owners. I, I could have spoken a lot more on other things, but I tried to pick out what I felt was relevant for us and then also help us to discuss more. In case there's something that you feel I have not touched on the economic side and you feel it impacts your business, kindly let me know or as we share, as we discuss, we'll be able to go over that. These are the proposed tax amendments and how they impact us. Uh, start with the income tax. We are seeing removal of withholding tax on winnings from gaming. One of the things, one of the controversial uh, taxes that have been have been added was the need to withhold on winnings from gaming, but this became 
practically difficult to ascertain what a win is. And so this has been removed. Uh, most of our governments, sometimes we are reactive. We look for things where we think there's money. So when you see a lot of youth in betting and gaming, you know there's money. Sometimes we put in place tax measures that are not practical. So this is one of them that's not practical. For businesses, uh, we are seeing that they're likely, they're likely to remove initial allowances. Uh, initial allowances, these are, this is like a, it's a capital depreciation that is given to you when you are determining the amount of, of tax you're going to pay as a business. So when you remove some of these, if you remove the initial allowance and you remove the industrial building allowance, what this means is that there is less appetite <clears throat> for businesses to invest uh, immediately in capital items because in the past you knew if I invested say my 1 billion in a capital asset, I'm going to have some, at least in the first two, three years, in the first two, two to three years, I'm going to have less pressure on income tax because I have this big initial allowance coming from the amount that I have invested, or I have this big industry building allowance that is coming from me putting up a building, or which, which qualifies for industry building allowance. So taking this away will impact you as a business because you won't have the ability to claim a capital deduction in the, in the most difficult years when you have just invested. Another one that is likely to pass today is a limitation on carrying forward deductions for assessed tax losses. Here, the, the bill is proposing that a taxpayer who has generated a loss for a period of five years may only deduct 50% of the assessed tax loss carried forward at the beginning of the following tax year and in the subsequent tax years. So what am I saying here? This is a, this, this, if this passes, it, it is assuming that most businesses should have a payback period of five years within which they could recover their initial investment. So I'm thinking that if, we, if this thing is passed into law, it may result in a taxation of investment. Uh, we, we've all been in business. We've tried different businesses in, a, in, in this country of ours. Sometimes it takes much longer than five years for you to be in a position to say, that the business is now breaking even. And in those earlier years, it's crucial for you to have your tax losses are carried forward because then you know that at least for all the troubles you have that like you're worried about as a, as a businessman or a businesswoman, uh, you're not worried about having to pay corporation tax to Uganda Revenue Authority. But now if they limit the ability for you to use your tax losses going forward, then that also creates another headache for you as, as, as a business person. And I'm saying here that this is likely to discourage investment as businesses may be required to pay taxes earlier than they can start to earn a return on their investment. So it's likely to find that the money you would have saved and reinvested in your business is now being channeled to you, Ghana Revenue Authority, to pay any underlying taxes. Um, there's, there's been an introduction of a 5% tax on non-residents providing digital services to customers in Uganda. It's something that Ronald mentioned earlier. So, so for example, if I am Google and I'm providing services to Ugandans, or I am uh, Netflix, I'm providing services to Ugandans, and so many other Oh, oh, I am Twitter, I am Facebook, I am Instagram. Uh, Uganda is saying that if these organizations are generating income from Uganda, they're going to pay a 5% tax. What am I saying here? We are saying that this is a tax obligation that users will need to be aware of. Most of us, our businesses have become digital or a lot of we have a lot of interactions with digital platforms to boost our businesses, to sell products, 
um, I, I, I used to pay, me and my wife, we used to run a, a small boutique and we used to pay some money to Facebook to be able to, to, to send an advert. It's an advert, and so many of you do that. Adverts on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and all. So what this means is that in the long run, your costs for you to be to be able to advertise your businesses on these platforms will go up as uh, these businesses trying to re- try to recoup some of this tax that was that was not there in the past. So it will just make the cost of doing businesses for the cost of doing business through digital platforms a little more expensive for you. So those are the amendments in the Income Tax Act. I know there were a couple of others that were that came out originally in the bills, but my understanding is that many of them will not pass. That's why I did not spend a lot of time on them. But for just to recap, I know somebody might ask me, how come you've not talked about this? They wanted to, to, to put a tax regime around collective investment schemes. Those are the unit trusts that are very popular to many young or to many corporates where they invest some of their money or even for businesses that have some excess liquidity. They've been putting their money in uh, co- collective investment schemes. Uh, reliably that has been fought by the private sector and from the last we had it had been dropped. There was also a desire to introduce more duty, to introduce duty on 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 cash withdrawals from digital platform from platforms. This would have mean that if I'm with if 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 I go to a bank ATM and I withdraw money I go to some of these mobile money aggregators and I withdraw my money, there would have been a tax on it. So it's one of those again that was uh, it was trying to be smuggled into into the bills. Uh, the private sector fought against it and it was dropped. Then uh, there were there were a raft of amendments that are, were planned around capital gains tax. And what uh, tax policy was proposing is that. Uh, instead of waiting, instead of somebody buying an asset, it grows in value and we tax the value. Uh, what we are saying that that uh, the moment you own a, an asset and you're selling it to somebody else, the moment you sell it, the person who is buying it is going to withhold 5% from the payment they're giving you. Of course, there was a lot of noise. Uh, from the public and outcry, uh, and there was a bit of a step back. We are hoping to see that, uh, we are praying that this is not passed into, into legislation today. Oh, it's not passed in the budget, forcing it to be passed into legislation soon. When it comes to VAT, one of the things they have introduced is sale by auction has been included as a supply for goods. So if if somebody is selling an item, for example, you have a car, you have a garage sale and you're selling off maybe your items, cars, you're selling off artworks and all. Previously, these were not taken to be standard rated supplies or supply of goods. What is happening now is that they will be taken as, as, a, as a supply of good on which VAT needs to be accounted for. So what is the implication for a business here is that this will make auction goods more expensive, making them less desirable for businesses that like finding value from auctions. I know a couple of you as businesses, you you bought cars maybe from UN, from, from various organizations from uh, during these auctions. Because now these will be taxable, they'll be slightly more expensive. Even you, when you want to sell off your goods through an auction, they will be more expensive, so the demand could be less than you had in the past. There's also been some clarification in 
in the there's got to be there's got to be some clarification in the VAT Act around the eligibility criteria for business use or use in the business when ascertaining whether VAT input tax is creditable. So one of the things I for those who own small businesses is that sometimes different assets you might have assets that are not necessarily used in your business, but for purposes of taxes, you say they are assets of the business. So what the act is saying that if you're selling a, an asset, which you are calling to be an asset for business use, you will only be allowed, if you're buying a, sorry, if you're, if you're buying an asset, which the other business has called uh, a, an asset used in business use, you will only be allowed a tax credit if that asset has been used for a related business generating a taxable supply. For example, if I'm in the car business and uh, maybe I sell you a house it might be difficult to claim a tax credit if I cannot prove that the house in question that was sold by somebody who is in the business of selling cars was a house that was being used by the business in generating its revenues that it obtains from selling cars. Yeah, so we here as businesses, we need to be careful. Uh, one, when we are buying business assets, also we need to be careful in what we are calling business assets. We need to be, you need to ensure that what we are calling business assets are really assets that we are using in our current business. Because if you are not, this is going to be challenged by URI and you're likely to lose your VAT. The next one is expanding the taxation of electronic services. Here they are saying that if you're a non-resident and you're providing electronic services in Uganda and you're earning more than 150 million shillings in a year from that business, you are required to register for VAT. This will impact entities like Google, like uh, Netflix, like Uber, because they easily make 150 million Uganda shillings in Uganda. So what does that mean? If they're registered for VAT in the country, then they will be required to charge VAT on their services and account for it with the tax authorities. This will make the cost of doing business more expensive. So we're going to see the cost of electronic services going up or for you as a business owner, simply because most of these people who are providing electronic services, many of them will be required to register for VAT in Uganda and start uh, invoicing you, including VAT. Uh, I'm just giving a, a related example. You've seen how it's not necessarily VAT, but you've seen how the cost of your DSTV has gone up over the last few months. It's mainly around targeting some of these services that in the past we had taken not to be, not to carry some taxes, but now they carry them. So something similar will happen uh, with, with some of the electronic services that we've been consuming as businesses in the country. We shall see the cost going up because now there will be VAT that will be added to those services. The other thing that the, the VAT amendment is looking at is that uh, they have expanded the scope for costs which do not qualify for input VAT. Uh, if you're a business and you've been paying some costs, entertainment costs, for example, you pay membership in a club, you're a member in an association, you pay member, you pay costs for a sports society, or you pay some costs for educational nature. The, the underlying VAT that you've been paying on those costs, you've been able to recover it 
in the past. Uh, but what the law is now going to do is to say that that VAT, even if you're paying it, you cannot recover it as a business. So this will make these expenses more expensive for you as a business. And what we're likely to see are uh, businesses may rationalize their entertainment budget. Because if they can't recover the VAT, uh, making it more expensive, they are likely to, to rationalize how much they spend on some of these activities. Another clarity which they are both, they're bringing in the law, they are saying that, that on the businesses that can claim input VAT will be those that generate a taxable supply. Uh, in the past, of course, you could, in some instances, you'd claim input VAT on the premise that you're going to make taxable supplies. It's been made clear that the only person who can claim input VAT is the one who is also generating taxable supplies. There'll be a requirement for you to file VAT returns uh, if you import services and you're paying VAT, reverse VAT on imported services. Uh, this has been not very enforce, enforceable for, for people, for, for, for businesses that deal in goods that don't have VAT. I mean, that sell goods that don't have VAT. Uh, because they sell goods that don't have VAT, they were never required to register for VAT, and therefore they were not obligated to file returns. But in most cases, you found that some of those businesses imported services. For example, if you have your IT system coming from Mumbai, India, you are paying some money to Mumbai, India. If you had your internet or maybe your storage files kept somewhere, maybe again in, in India, you are paying some money. So, and URA was asking you to account for reverse VAT on your imported services. And that was it. But now they are saying that on top of you paying your reverse VAT on imported services, you will be required to file a VAT return similar to somebody who has been making uh, supplies that have VAT. What does this mean? It just means that there'll be an extra tax burden, an extra tax administration burden. I forgot the word administration. Maybe an extra tax administration burden for those who have been, been filing returns in the past. Another one, a controversial one, uh, that they want, they're proposing to amend the, the removal of requirement for URA to seek consent from a taxable person on the utilization of your tax credit. Currently, if you're a tax, if we're a taxable person's input tax exceeds output tax by 5 million, for example, the, the amount of, of, of input tax, the amount of VAT I have paid as a business compared to the amount of VAT that I have received as a business. If the, if the VAT I have paid is more than 5 million uh, compared to the VAT I have received, I had a right to go to URA and instruct them on how I wanted to use my tax credit. I could apply for cash or I could tell them, use it to offset my future VAT obligation. What the law is doing now is that there would be no need for you to give URA your consent on how they can use your tax credit. They will be able to use it against you. Again, they'll be able to use it for your business, for your good, according to how they deem fit. So for a business, this takes away your discretion on how to utilize your tax credit. And uh, because for us, as you as a business, you might you know your seasons, you know when you will have cash flow problems, where you will need to use some of the goodwill you have developed over the year, including your tax credit. So you know when you want to use it. 
But now, if they take away your right for you to use it when you feel like, I feel like I, 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 I my, in my interpretation, it will impact your cash flow planning, especially for those businesses where your input tax in some months is high, has been higher than your output tax. As I, don't, I, I, I don't think it's good for business. Next, they touched some items in on the exemption schedule. We had that that big debate on diapers, uh, on, on on the adult diapers, on the on the on the young people diapers. The way the bill came out, the bill came out in a way that adult diapers will be exempt. They will only leave the other like baby diapers being subject to VAT. But there was a very big debate in parliament. My thinking is that when they pass the law today, so when they read the budget today, the proposal is likely for all diapers to be subject to VAT. They, uh, to make concentrates and seed cake cheaper, for I, I had, we have a lot of farmers here. It, this has been a big issue for the farming world, the people who are into chicken rearing and, and the like, there was a lot of ambiguity about concentrates. And this was impacting the price at which farmers would get concentrates and also impacting, obviously, the whole poultry industry or the piggery industry. Happy to note that there's been clarity on that. They are going to add the supply of concentrates and seed cake to the exemption schedule in the VAT Act. What this means is that the supply of concentrates and seed cake will carry no VAT. However, they have removed the supply of all production inputs into iron ore smelting from, from the list of exemption. They have also removed the supply of production inputs for processing hides and skins into finished leather products from the exemption list. I know there are a couple of cottage industries that are in two the leather business, whether uh, making shoes, bags, and all kinds of leather products. This will be uh, in this will in be injurious to the current business setup. The cost of your inputs will go up as a result of the fact that they have been removed from the exemption list. They will carry VAT. So they, in similarly, they have removed from the exemption list, the supply of the other products only made in Uganda from exempt, exempt supply. So the input has been made exempt, and it's also the output. It is all, it is, uh, I, I upload the tax policy for this because what usually happens sometimes in tax policy is that they make one side of the equation exempt while leaving the other side taxable. And when you do that, you've not helped a businessman, you've simply made a, the, the business more expensive. It's always good to look at both sides of the equation and you make them exempt such that the person supplies as he buys them, they're exempt. Sorry, so now they're taxable, but also in this case, because now when you say the inputs are taxable, and also when I sell my product, it's taxable, at least on one part, the equation is balanced. The challenge for the people in the leather industry is now that now you need to start accounting for VAT uh, that you've not been accounting for in the past. This comes with extra tax administration burdens and naturally indirect taxes sometimes are always difficult to always be in full compliance. So it, it begins to expose you to tax risk, tax audits, you become a favorite of the tax authorities. Usually, the tax authorities love businesses that are exposed to a lot of indirect taxes because there's always cheap money to collect from such businesses. So the moment you're put into that bracket of paying indirect taxes, then you become very susceptible to tax audits. Uh, excise, du excise duty, there have there been some definitions that have been uh, put in place just to ensure that products are 
properly defined for exercise duty. I won't spend too much time on that. I'll just try to ex spend time on, on the actual impact on your businesses. So what, those who are into OP OPEC beer, currently the duty is 20% or Uganda shillings 230 per liter, whichever is higher. They are proposing 12% or Uganda shillings 150 per liter. This is to, uh, there was a lot of outcry from people, from manufacturers that manufacture, that produce OPEC beer. It had become expensive and the target market was no longer able to afford it. This should bring a, a respite on that and enable people to be able to consume their OPEC beer. And denatured spirits made from locally produced raw materials. Uh, these are undenatured spirits with alcoholic strength by volume of 80% or more that are being made from locally produced raw materials. The current duty we have on this is 60% of the value or 1,500 per liter. So this is being maintained, uh, same, same as uh, number three, ready to drink spirits. Uh, currently, these have been having a new duty. They're going to have a duty of 80% or 1,700 shillings per liter, whichever is higher. Then, yeah, and denatured spirits made from locally produced raw materials used in the production of disinfectants and sanitizers uh, for the prevention of the spread of COVID-19. These have remained at nil. Even in the proposal, they will remain at nil. So when it comes to fruit trees and vegetable trees, except for trees made from at least 30% pulp or at least 30% trees by weight or volume, uh, we are saying that uh, the current duty prices are going to be maintained. What has happened is that they, it's just that the definition of food trees has, has been made clearer. Any other non-alcoholic beverage locally produced other than the beverage referred to above, currently the duty is at 12% or 250 shillings per liter. This is being revised downwards to 12% or UGX 150 shillings. This is good. This has been a growing part of our economy that feeds into our manufacturing. And it's good to see that there's been some respite in the taxes. Uh, there's been no change, there's been no change on inter income international calls except calls from Kenya, Rwanda, and South Sudan. Then any other fermented beverages, the duties have been maintained as they are. Uh, for construction materials or for a ma manufacturer, the duties have been remained, have remained at new. The general note here I can make on excise duty is that in the past, I think from the time I started working, is that there's, there's always been pressure on excise duty every year, trying to increase it on, on what they call from the perspective of the sin tax, whether it's cigarettes, whether it's alcohol, there's always been a desire, the appetite to increase it. There's also there's been an appetite to increase excise duty on fuel uh, from the government over the years. We are happy to note that the, that's not the direction that tax policy has taken in the current year. Uh, there's also been appetite to increase excise duty on the new economy, especially around financial services. Yeah, true to form, this year they wanted to do it but there was a bit of outcry from the industry that made them push back. So as always, uh, when there's pushback from, from, from businesses, those are always taxes to watch because in the next year, you will know they will come up, they will come back in one form or another as they try to make them pass. But generally from a business perspective, at least this year, there's a bit of, of calmness around excise duty and it has not been the aggressiveness that we have seen in the last few years that sometimes has made doing business in Uganda very unpredictable and uh, are very disturbing. I mean, if I compare it to our neighbors in Kenya who are having it very rough, uh, I can only say that it's been, it's been, it's a bit, it's been 
a bit mild, or if I compare it to some of the countries in West Africa, where there's been a lot of push around this, I could say that for Uganda, there's been some calmness in the last, in, in the proposals they're making for 2023, 2024. But as, as I mentioned, as businesses, we need to always be aware when these things come up and we need to be at the forefront of the discussions and help to change to, 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 and, and help to impact on the direction of tax policy around excise duty. The tax procedure code, definitely the tax authorities are looking for money and every year we see them becoming a little bit strict on the tax procedure code. One of the things they've, they've, they're bringing out is that there'll be implication for failure to comply with the notice to obtain information or evidence. So they're saying here that the bill proposes that where a taxpayer fails to provide the information requested for under section 42 of the tax procedures code act, this taxpayer shall not be allowed to provide that information at objection to a tax decision or during alternative dispute resolution. So they're saying that during the audit, if the tax tax authorities comes to you and they ask for information and then you hold it back, this information will not be permissible in case your matter needs dispute resolution. So just trying to ensure that taxpayers as a, or as a business, you provide all necessary information that you know might impact your case with the tax authorities. They are creating some more harsh offenses for people to try to fix tax stamp on wrong goods. And we're saying that the bill is proposing that a taxpayer who fixes and activates a tax stamp on an incorrect good, brand or volume. Uh, the law is saying that it's, you're committing an offense and you're liable on conviction for a fine not exceeding 10 million Uganda shillings or imprisonment not exceeding three years. So they're trying to be more punitive. I, we've seen the stories this week of people who are forging invoices. This is going to, we're going to see more of this story cutting across as government tries to collect, to collect more revenue. There's also been expansion of scope for penal tax relating to tax stamps. Now they're saying that if an, any unauthorized person tries to interfere or tamper with a digital tax stamp, on conviction, you're going to spend 30 years in, in imprisonment, or so you're going to spend 30 million Uganda shillings or imprisonment not exceeding 10 years. Why is this important? Over the last few years, we have seen Uganda revenue increase, Uganda URA being able to increase their tax collections, not necessarily because the economy has grown, not necessarily because they have created too many new taxes, but because of digitalization. When they introduced digital tax stamps. They were able to collect more tax revenues than they had been collecting before. So they're simply telling you, don't try to play with our bread. If you play with our bread, we shall be punitive. Then there's also been the wave of interest accrued as of 1st July 2017 in excess of principal tax and penal tax. The bill is proposing that if there was interest due and payable under a tax law as of 1st July 2017, which was exceeding the aggregate of the principal tax and the penal tax, that interest is waived. This is mainly to harmonize the ledger reconciliation. All of you as businessmen, as business ladies, one of the biggest nightmares you've had over the last one year or two years has been ledger reconciliation. You get like 10, 10 emails almost every week about somebody demanding tax because they, they think your ledger has not been reconciled. So I think that, that there, is, that there is a desire, there's an, a, a concerted desire to ensure that people's ledgers are reconciled and people are allowed to focus on their business instead of focusing a lot of time trying to, to reconcile a ledger. Then lastly, there's been some reform in the Lotteries and Gaming Act. The bill seeks to increase the gaming tax rate from 20% to 30% of the total amount of money staked, less the payments, the payouts for the period of filing returns. 
the, in Uganda, anything that shows signs of prospering, the government will want a bigger share of that success. So uh, the, the gaming industry is now a victim of its success as government has come to demand more. So if you're, inv you're involved, if you, you're invested in the, in the gaming industry, expect more taxes in 2024, 2023. I would like to stop there and hand back to Ronnie and see reactions from people. Uh, thanks a lot, Peter, for that submission. Quite a bit to swallow in one session, uh, yeah. but I guess that all of us on, uh, on the call can agree that Peter has helped us kind of narrow this big thing called the budget into what it really means to each and every one of us. There are a number of messages coming through, uh, and, and I think that they are powerful messages. I was uh, excited about what you said about excise duties. Uh, the, the government going slow, I think it's a response and possibly a sign that uh, that also government is listening to some of the cries of the private sector to be able to transform uh, their businesses and to grow. Uh, certainly the pressure is on. Uh, that last bit you talked about, the government hand tightening, I think at an individual business level, and I think Peter talked about it, it's very, very important to appreciate that in as much as the taxes may not change, the ones which exist possibly, you have obligations to them that you have not been meeting. And I think that all of us have seen that uh, uh, the, the URA is coming out more to be able to, to, to make sure that the taxes that have to be paid, a fair share is paid by every individual. So the, the, the business community on the call, I think that's one of the important messages that uh, get in touch with uh, with a tax advisor. We have a couple of tax advisors on the call and make sure that you, at least your taxes are in order. Uh, we have a few minutes, Peter, uh, and I'm just going to request that you allow us to take a couple of questions uh, from the audience. I'll allow those who can put up their hands to ask. Please do raise your hand and I'll give you an opportunity to ask your question. There are a couple of questions which have come through in the chat box, and uh, I will I will read a few of those uh, as we as we as we also look 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 forward to the ones which are going to come through uh, in the in in, in uh, uh, which are going to come through with the with the hands. So I see here we have uh, we have a question from um, uh, from Kennedy Kennedy Kalunji. I think it's my obi. Uh, will uh, will the companies already carry existing tax losses for the past seven years? Write them off. I think you talked about the the the, the five year the five year the five year uh, the, that you can't carry your losses beyond five years. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think to that question, Peter, I also wanted you to comment as you answer Kennedy's question. Uh, to comment on what that means on the way people will invest, uh, my, my impression is that their business, their sectors, for example, the manufacturing sector has a tendency of having to last a long time before you start realizing profit. So I would want to hear your mind on what you think about the impact of specifically that provision on uh, investments in two sectors like manufacturing, which take a bit longer, uh, does that push more people into what you'd call short-term return uh, industry? So you'll possibly comment on that, Peter. Um, uh, Andrew Kigundu says, is fighting new taxes counterproductive in the long run, uh, such as the need for broadening the tax base or building a stronger economy? I don't know whether that word is that, that I think I think you talk about are the new taxes can they be counterproductive in the long run building a, a tax base or the pushback on these taxes you could possibly address that uh, yes Rita we, you will be able to access the presentation we'll send you a PDF of the presentation after the call all of everyone who registered will be able to get it and also the recording uh, of this presentation Moses Guire has a question here. 
Uh, please clarify on exemption on the exemption issue. If an item is removed from the exemption list, it becomes taxable at either zero or full rate, which enables the taxpayer to claim the input tax. I think uh, Moses here wants more clarification on what does it mean to be if was an item to leave the exemption uh, list. Um, yes, I see another question here. A uh, number of thank yous. Uh, Alan Nisima is saying, uh, does it mean that uh, is removed from the exemption, we cannot claim VAT paid on it? Uh, uh, no, it doesn't mean that if an item is removed from the exemption, we cannot claim VAT paid on it. Uh, I think that's the question there. Yes, Martin will share the presentation. Uh, let me see if there are any hands. Uh, Peter, you could possibly address that group of questions. Let me give you one more, and uh, okay. then we can we can see if we can do another round. Let me see if we have a hand in the chat box. Just a moment. Yes, I think there is one final question here. Also clarify on the issue of VAT tax credits in excess of 5 million being used by URA to offset future VAT, uh, VAT liabilities. I think, uh, Peter, here you talked about the right that uh, URA will have to kind of make uh, use your, your, your tax credit. I think that's what, uh, what Moses here is asking about. Uh, yeah. and, and I think to Moses's question, I'll possibly add one which I had picked up here. This question of who owns the tax credit, if the tax credit is mine, how can it be used without my permission? I, I wanted to know that. And uh, and for me, when you mentioned it, is this something, and possibly in your experience in other nations, is this something which can ex extend to my bank account? Because uh, you worry when and uh, something which you own, someone can use without consulting you. So that, 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 that's something I wanted you to comment on. And possibly when you look at the region, how does that look like? Peter, you can take those questions and then we'll have another round. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, let, let me start with the ones that you read out earlier and I'll go to the chat and try to address them schematically. The question from Kennedy on tax losses being carried forward. Yeah, if you've made, losses for the last seven years and what's going to happen now. So they're saying that, okay, now come 2020 to 2024, uh, they're giving you a limit on how far those tax losses you've been, you've been picking for the last seven, seven years, how far you can carry them forward going, going forward. In the past, our tax losses, you could carry them forward perpetually until the time you make profit. So what they're saying is that now going forward, that is gone. You will have a limit on how far those tax losses you've been carrying in your book can be carried forward uh, in, in, in your book. So they will make it a limit. After five years, they become uh, hotel, like they say, and then you're required to pay taxes based on, on your circumstances. Then this will also impact investment because like, like Ronald, you've, you've mentioned, certain investments take time and like manufacturing for you to be able to realize uh, taxable profits. And these tax losses act as a cushion for you to be able to uh, get to a point where you stabilize and, and make money. I remember sometime back, back in the day when I was, uh, when I was, in an accounting firm, an audit firm, there was this, this company we, we used to audit. They were big time in manufacturing <clears throat> and providing, providing goods that are very crucial to an economy. They had, they were into pharmaceuticals and some other businesses, I won't mention them for, for, for privacy sake. But you can, this, they, they had a certain amount of tax losses that helped them for a period of about 10 years when they were not making profits, these tax losses were very handy in enabling them to stabilize. And it, those, are, those are things that give you an appetite for somebody to put 
money in uh, in such enterprises that take a while. So what is likely to happen is that we are likely to see some cooling off from certain investments that take some time to create taxable profits. And you find people either divesting some of the money into items that quickly bring a, that, that quickly bring, break even to be able to beat a, the imposed tax cost that is going to arise where tax losses cannot be carried forward for more than five years. So definitely this proposal is anti-investment, especially investment that take significant time to make. Somebody is asking, Andrew was asking some ideas on how to create enough revenue. Any comments on climate change, drought and rainstorms creating more harm? Yes, if you look at the, the budget policy framework and what they've mentioned as how they're going to create revenue, I'll start from what government says and what I think as a, as a citizen of the country. They are focusing on certain things. Uh, they are focusing on uh, fiscal consolidation. Uh, they're focusing on enabling agriculture. They're focusing on enabling tourism. Um, I've the other two. There are about five of them. See, to enable us to create more revenue as a country. Of course, infrastructure, to create more revenue as a country, to allow the infrastructure to allow the economy to grow and create more revenue. Yeah. M my thinking yeah, my, my thinking as, as me is that one, we need to be very, we need to be very, um, we, need, we, need, we, need, we, need, we need to be very consistent around um, allow or uh, uh, attracting foreign, foreign direct investment. We need to be, other, other, other neighboring countries are doing it so well. I mean, if you look at Rwanda and the kind of effort they are putting in ensuring that dollars come their way and what we're doing here in Uganda, we are not, we are not well coordinated. I think that's what I wanted to say. We're not well coordinated. I think things like putting in place the infrastructure that makes it natural for foreign direct investment to come to a country is very, very critical. And you can never run away from it. Uh, I, I always give this example that if it wasn't for MTN, Airtel, and a few banks and a few NGOs, our Kampala would still be ending in, in Tinder. If you're looking at the Gayaza Road, it will still be ending somewhere in Zana. If you're looking at the Entebbe Road, it will be still ending somewhere nearby. But what foreign direct investment does is that uh, this it has a multiplier effect. Some, if you can imagine how many Ugandan millionaires have been created because of the existence of MTN. There are many mobile money aggregators, there are many suppliers, there are so many people who do different things. That there are businesses that have grown from that ecosystem and become big and employ over 100 people. It's the same thing with the, with the, with the banks. It's the same thing. And in the process, you begin to grow a middle class that is spreading out from Kampala and going to Wakiso and going to Mukono. And unless we are deliberate as a country to, to do that, uh, we will not create enough revenue in this country. When you do, when you when you create, when you allow FDI to come, it also simply means that small SMEs will be able to grow. People will be able to start small businesses knowing that the economy has enough economic demand, enough consumption, and these businesses will be able to thrive. Without that, then we cannot do much. I mean, you've seen people try all kinds of things in this economy, but as long as there's no aggregate demand in the economy, the economy can't, can't grow. And we need, as a country, to be, to be a little bit more surgical and say, okay, we need to focus on these things. What are the things that create aggregate demand in the economy? Jobs. And how do jobs come? You need people to invest in your economy. And when people invest in your economy, that spurs the local population also to invest in the economy. And when those two things happen, uh, we grow aggregate demand, which means that uh, indirect taxes grow, which also means that income taxes grow. 
So I feel like that is something we keep beating about the bush. We talk about roads, we talk about uh, quoting, in, quoting people to come and invest here, but there's no clear strategic direction as a country to make it happen. Yeah. On climate change, um, yeah, definitely we've seen that in the last two years. Food inflation has gone up because of the climate change that we have seen in the past. And if you look at the Bank of Uganda monetary report, one of the things they've always maintained quarter each quarter is that, yes, they are optimistic the economy is going to grow, but they're also pessimistic on the fact that there are external shocks that might impact it. And some of these things are around climate change and how these impact the agriculture or uh, uh, supply chain. So, these are things that we, we we are to live with as a country, unfortunately. Um, and this will always impact our agricultural output. And if our agricultural output is impacted, we see that impacting a key macroeconomic policy. It impacts inflation, it impacts prices, it impacts the cost of doing business in the country. So it's something to watch out for as has been highlighted by, by Bank of Uganda. Uh, this thing about reducing tax leakage does not increase tax base. Is your head doing anything innovative in that direction? Unfortunately, ERA no. ERA, in my, in my view, they're focused on meeting their targets. Uh, and, and for them, that's their battle. On one hand, you can't blame them because they have targets on their head. Uh, there's nothing there. It, they, so they focus on what is there and they try to do it. But one of the things it, that I'm involved with in my other life is we're trying to push and say that let's come up with a clear tax strategy as a country. We, we can't keep running the country like the way we're running it, knee jack. See something growing, we try to tax it without uh, holistically looking at its ecosystem. And this is something we are trying to push that we need to reach a point where as a country, just like we have strategies for so many other things, we have a clear revenue uh, increasing strategy that looks at something, researches it, and comes up with a policy that enables us to grow the tax base. Currently what we are doing, this is my view, uh, people might have different views, but what we are doing currently is knee jerk and it's, it doesn't help anybody. It's just impacting businesses more and more. Yeah, and there's only much tax leakage reduction can do. It will work for the first two, three years. Uh, I, I, have, I, I, have, I have been a finance officer before. And one of the things you do when, you, when you're a finance officer is you want to have a big profit. What do you do? You try to minimize costs, 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 and you do it for two, three years and everybody is happy about what you've done. But after some time, it begins to bite. There's only much you can do. You need to design strategies on how to grow the, the top, top line for you to remain competitive. And that's what we need to do. It's not just a matter of URA. This is goes to the heart of tax policy Minister of finance, being able to create a comprehensive tax strategy that researches through things before something is put across as, um, as, a, tax, as a tax making a, um, as a tax collection tool. Because what we are seeing today, somebody will, will come and, and smuggle in a tax measure. And when you try to challenge it, they're saying, we need to increase our revenues. How are we going to take care of the needs of the country? But I'm saying that is the wrong approach. We need to sit back and say, where do we want to be in two years, in three years? Where are we going to collect this money from? Where is the research we have done? If we introduce excess duty on mobile money, what is the impact it's having on other businesses? That is where we need to get. And if we get there, then we will be able to increase our tax base organically and reach to the heights we want to get to. I can spend a lot of time on that because I'm very passionate about it. It annoys me very much, but uh, let me try to move on to something else. Melanie is saying, is that in addition to 15% withholding tax and 18% reverse VAT? Uh, I'm, I, I don't want, I'm, my comment here is that I'm not so sure how this is going to pan out when it when it comes into law, the 5% on the digital services. 
my initial take at the moment that it will also include these two. That's what it will be, and it will be very expensive. But let's see how the modalities will come out. I can't really comment on exactly how this will work, but um, this is what it's looking like. And if there's, if there's somebody here from uh, tax policy from URA who can throw more light on how digital service tax is going to be um, meted out, please add your voice to it. Finally, yeah. who the company is already, okay, I have I've mentioned that, is fighting new taxes that are productive in the long run, such as the need to broaden the tax base. Uh, this one is yes and no. I think for me, um, there are things we need. To, there are things we, we should fight, and there are things we should allow her to be. But I think for me, the most important thing, even before we come to the fight, is do we have a, have we done our research? Have we done our have we done our research? Come out and said if we introduce this tax measure, these are the pros, and these are the cons. My feeling is the way we are going about it is that we are doing it the Ugandan way. The Ugandan way is. Chifuna, let me use my language. Chifuna, or somebody has invested in fish, fish is making money. Let me also go and create a pond next to him. And I also invest in fish and I make money. And unfortunately, that has also come into the way we set policies as a country. We try to we see, we see people who are transacting on mobile money. We say, ah, these guys have money. Excise duty. Without thinking about it, without doing the research necessary to say, okay, if I introduce exercise duty, what am I killing in return? We see uh, we see people on on internet. We say, ah, these are granddaughters of mine are, have a lot of money. They are putting on MBs. Let's see how we can tax it more. The 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 the, the feeling the, the the heart is not bad. But the issue is, how are we going about it? Are we doing enough research for us to say, this is the direction we should take, this is the direction we should take. If the research is there, uh, then it makes the people who fight taxes think hard and say, okay, how are we going to grow our tax base? But if it's not there and every year we just come up with measures and policies that are not thought, well thought out, they work for a year, we take them back. I mean, it becomes problematic. And I'll give an example. Uh, yes, yesterday we were in some, some somewhere, and people are asking, "What did you think about VAT on imported services last year?" If you're in the industry, account from financial services, you did not have to account for VAT when you paid for your licenses for your IT system or for people who are abroad. Why? Because they are put a they are put a measure that says that if you're involved in exchange supplies in Uganda, whatever you import, you won't have to account for VAT. We are very happy because it saved us a lot of money. But even me as a person in the banking industry, I, I, I said, I looked in the one year, did it make the banking industry better? No, it didn't. Costs didn't become cheaper because people are not paying VAT. We were just happy to report more profits, but we could not see the real tangible impact in the in the economy. And then, of course, when everybody realized that there was a big financial gap that was being created by it, they reversed it. And I knew they were going to reverse it because nobody had sat down to, to do the necessary research to say, okay, if I remove this VAT from these guys who are dealing in exempt supplies, what is the likely impact it's going to have on the revenue base? We just listened to the pressure that was coming from a few manufacturers. We went to with a policy, we put it in place, and then one year later we realized that we had we had actually made a mistake to do so. But this would have been avoided if people had done their research and come up with a clear strategy. Is somebody Moses asked is uh Please clarify on exemption issue. If an item is removed from exemption list, it becomes taxable either at zero or full rate, which enables the taxpayer to claim input tax. Uh, that is correct. The moment you make uh, a, 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 an item when it's no longer exempt and becomes taxable, then you're, you're allowed to recover your input VAT. 
the point I was trying to put across is that sometimes um, you are, a, I mean, sorry, not you are, the tax policy looks at one side of the equation. For example, the example I gave of data. Uh, imagine they came and said that the supply of leather products uh, is ex remains exempt, but the supply of the leather inputs are taxable. What would that mean for you as a ta as as a businessman? It will simply mean that when I'm buying my inputs, I'm paying them with VAT. But when it comes to me to supply a finished product, I am supplying it at no VAT, meaning that I am not I'm not allowed to recover the input VAT I'm incurring, which becomes a big cost for me. So, yeah. But if tax policy looks at the whole equation like they've done for leather, they've said we are removing the exemption on the input. So when when I pay for V when I pay VAT on the input. I'll be able to offset it when I sell my leather products because my leather products are also vertible and I'm allowed to claim input VAT. The equation has been balanced well, so I won't suffer as a businessman that much. The challenge is when we look at one side of the equation and we make the business worse off. I hope that I've, I've explained that better. So yeah, does it mean that if an item is removed from the exemption, you cannot claim but paid on it? No, it simply means that if it has been removed from exemption, it has become vertible. And because it's vertible, you are now allowed to claim any input VAT you have incurred in creating that vertical supply. Uh, Moses N, clarify on the issue of of VAT tax credit in excess of 5 million being used by URA to offset future VAT liability, that will the amount carry forward the tax credit for how long will that be? Okay. Yes, and I think this is what uh, Ronnie hinted on. So we're trying to say that in the past, if I had a VAT tax credit in excess of 5 million, it was to my discretion to use it uh, the way I felt fit. That was on me as a taxpayer. So I could wait maybe if it, if I've, I've seen it in August, I could wait till November to use it. When I, I would say my November is likely not to look good. So I'll put in, I'll ask for my claim in November. So what the law is going to do now is that that discretion is being taken away from you as a taxpayer. You or I will determine on when and how to, to apply the tax credit. The biggest example I can give, if, you, if you've ever been in employment, where I used to work in the past, you could accumulate leave days. Somebody accumulates four months of leave days. And the day they resign from the organization, you have to pay them for those four months that they have accumulated as leave. So one day management realized that people were doing this. They will work, work, and create so many months of leave. So one day the management decided to take away the right of you to determine when you take your leave. And they say, okay, now today, Simon, stop, go and leave for two months. So what they, in a way they, they, have, they have given you an entitlement of leave, but they've taken away the right at which you can exercise your right to take leave. So this is what this law is going to do. You will still get your tax credit, but they're taking away your right to determine when you can take the tax credit. Yeah. Uh, yes, Andrew mentioned you didn't tell us on the budget allocations. Unfortunately, I tried to get the accurate information about the budget allocations. I couldn't get because it was a lot, it was still in the framework. That will come through today as Matia reads through the budget. So maybe something I will, we will debate tomorrow in the headlines when those allocations have, have come through. So I couldn't do much about that. Anything affecting schools? Not in particular that I have seen, whatever is, uh, that is a question from Belinda. Not in particular, all the things that we've mentioned are affecting businesses generally, but there's nothing that has been specifically mentioned about schools. 
Uh, Julius is saying thank you, Peter, for the excellent presentation earlier. You mentioned the fact that businesses are stressed, which is a true assessment of the current economic situation. Are some types of businesses more exposed than others? What should businesses be doing to survive and if possible come out of it stronger? Yes, uh, there are some businesses that are more exposed than others. Like I mentioned earlier, there's been less credit appetite from certain businesses like uh, like the real estate business and the like. So these are more impacted than others. I mean, if you go around, if you go, if you're in the real estate business, and if you ask your business, it has really been impacted over the last two, three years because uh, real estate moves on credit. People need to be able to access a certain amount of credit for them to either buy a property or for them to, to buy cement, to buy all these kind of things that are needed to put up a property. So that is a business that has been heavily impacted by the current uh, economic conditions. The importation business has been impacted uh, because people are not buying. People are not, uh, also the service industry has been impacted over the over for the last few months because I mean when when people don't have money in their pockets, naturally the things they cut out are services. Whether you're a business, you find that you're paying less to your auditors, to your accountants, or whatever. If you're an individual, you're consuming less of DSTV and all these other goods, all, all these other services, because you're focusing on um, on on the most crucial things. Uh, I got a call from 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 DSTV. I had not paid DSTV for two months um, uh, because I felt like the utility I was getting was had ended. Football had ended and and all that. And school fees was also coming up. And the person asked me. What is the problem? That like I told the person, school fees. I mean, when 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 you have little disposable income, it becomes the basics. It becomes school fees. It becomes food in the house, and that's it. So some of these other services become less important to you. So services, real real estate, uh, manufacturing, those are areas that have been heavily impacted by the current economic skew. Alan is inquiring about withholding tax. We are in we are in a distribution services and customers always withhold money from us without any document to show what they have taken from me. What is the correct procedure for withholding? Um, yeah, so what happens is that if you have suppliers that are withholding tax agents, the moment you cannot show, you cannot prove to them that you are exempt from withholding, they are going to withhold from you. But it's also your right when they withhold from you to ask them for evidence of that withholding from you so that uh, at the end of the year, you're able to claim your tax credit. So it's your right to demand from anybody who has withheld from you details of what has been withheld from you, including a tax credit, a tax credit certificate. Melanie is asking, in addition, if some of these companies like Google are registered for VAT, does that mean it will be a double payment? Or one of the supplier we only do with holding? So if Google is registered for VAT in Uganda, what that means is that they will now be providing services like any other Ugandan company. So it will stop being an imported service. So you will only have to account for VAT, like you would have, uh, you would have accounted for VAT for any other local vendor making supplies to use. I hope that clears that. Uh, and if they're registered in Uganda, then the, the service they give to you, this service they give to you stops being an imported service for which you don't need to account for reverse, or I mean, you need to account for withholding tax. So now they become, they become resident. Joseph is saying the knee-jerk reaction is unfortunately driven by the desire to hit collection targets. And you're right, there is need to have a better comprehensive tax policy. One of the drawbacks of the current policies is mainly driven by the revenue enforcers and this is good. I couldn't agree more, Joseph. Uh, this is something I can chat about the whole day. Uh, yeah, there, there are things we need to improve as a country if you're going to be serious about growing this country, growing the revenues of this country. There are certain things we need to be serious about and stop being reactive and become proactive. Okay. Anything affecting farmers other than the feeds? Nothing that I'm aware of, Elizabeth. 
at the moment. Nothing that I'm aware of, apart from what I've mentioned. Uh, thank you. Martin, comment noted. Alan is asking any tax changes to be excited about as entrepreneurs in, in any field. I've tried to summarize that. I mean, not necessarily a tax tend to be excited about, but what I can say generally is that Uganda has been mild on, on, on rocking the boat. I think there's a lot of feedback from people and there's a desire to create a, a predictable environment for entrepreneurs. That's the only thing I can say. There, there hasn't been too much rocking of the boat. Just take on our neighbors in Kenya and how much their boat is being rocked. Whether you're small, whether you're big, whether you're medium, you are being rocked heavily. Take on your friends in West Africa. For those of you who have friends in West Africa, whether you're big, whether you're small, or just across the border in Congo here, just in Congo here, whether you're big or you're small, they are really rocking your boat. So which to me is a good thing. Ronnie, I think I'm through with them. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Peter, uh, for that uh, comprehensive feedback. Our time is fast spent, uh, and I'm just going to allow you a minute or two to just summarize and uh, really any final remarks uh, to, 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 to the topic today. What is clear is that almost uh, a number of things which you talked about, I think we even need entire sessions about uh, some, some specific tax issues, which I think a number of entrepreneurs and possibly we'll see how we can build on this. Uh, we may have to have a conversation specifically on taxes, but on the budget, I think someone made a comment about the fact that we, we also need to discuss where is government putting its money and how, what opportunities can come up for entrepreneurs. And I believe that that's also a discussion of itself and a session which, we, uh, which we'll consider uh, doing in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but for now, Peter, just share with us your final remarks, then we can wrap up. Okay. Thank you. Just allow me for uh, nepotism's sake to answer the last question that has come in. As mm -hmm. somebody wrote, what is the implication of refugee flux into our country on our revenue tax base as they consume public utility services? Yeah, that's one way to look at it. Yes, they, they consume our public utility services. Uh, but it's important also to look at how much money is coming in because of them and also some of them that get integrated into business. I've seen a couple of them get integrated into business and do good things in the country, but obviously they do impact on the consumption of public utility services in the country. Or well, Alan, I'll reach out to you separately. What document can I ask from the customer who has withheld? Ask them for, it, for your tax credit, certificate. tax credit certificate, they should give it to you. What steps can I take or legal procedures to get my withholding tax certificate? You can reach out to URA because now the good thing now they have a system in place. Somebody who has withheld from you, there are records to show on the other hand, either hand on the other side that they have withheld from you. But if they have withheld from you and have not remitted it to Uganda Revenue Authority, reach out to Uganda Revenue Authority, determine whether they have, they have remitted the money to Uganda Revenue Authority. If they haven't, then consult your lawyer on the next steps to help you uh, get legal redress. My closing remarks uh, are this, is that um, the economy has struggled uh, for the last two or three years. Uh, we've always been looking forward to it becoming better and stronger. That hasn't been the case and we have seen it in all aspects of life. I don't know anybody who hasn't cried uh, because of the economy. Whether you steal money and you don't and you don't steal money, you have cried. Whether you are a big investor, a small investor, you have cried. It's been tough for everybody. Whether you're a money lender or you are on the side of borrowing money, you are, everybody has felt the impact. The, the, there are factors to indicate that this is going to get better, better than how it has been before. But that improvement is not going to happen now. Um, most people are saying uh, it. The big, the big changes are going to happen maybe around March 2024 next year, getting into the second quarter. That's what many people have predicted. So let's just stay the course and weather the storm. It's still on for, not, for the next seven or so months. It's beginning to change now, but it's going to still be tough for the next seven or eight months. 
and hopefully the economy will pick up next year and you see better results. Uh, yeah, for on the on the on the revenue side, on the tax policy side, um, uh, there are measures that have been put in place, and in my opinion, they could have been worse. Uh, it's not too bad this year. I think what has been critical this year is that there's a lot of information flow to people uh, such that there's no accountability. I'll give an example. When people try to sneak in certain tax clauses around this time, people were very alert. And people went out, they reached their MPs, they reached out to whoever they could reach out to to manage that process. Uh, and for me, it's something positive about us as Ugandans that it's no longer us just making noise on WhatsApp, making jokes, but actually there are a critical number of people who are saying, okay, wait a minute, we're not going to allow people to just take us by surprise. But for granted, we're going to push back. And that pushback is helping us to create some level of sanity around how we come up with our tax policies. But the overarching need for us is to sit down and have a proper tax policy strategy that is going to help us grow in the foreseeable future. We can no longer afford to be knee jack like, we, like we've been in the past. Super, super, super. Thanks a lot, Peter. Uh, I guess as you have rightly put it, uh, it is a continuous journey for the, the country needs to grow. We need taxes to be able to grow, but equally the institutions that generate those taxes are the businesses which you, the listeners, run. And the success of those business is at the center of the success of this entire budget and the success of the growth of the nation. So I guess it's a continuous conversation. I like the fact, Peter, that you mentioned that a number of people are watching out, making sure that there is pushback, there is advocacy to make sense. And Peter mentioned earlier about some of the, even the proposals in the budget, which were striked out earlier, but that pushback is important so that we can be able to get the best cocktail for the growth of our economy and our country as a whole. Peter, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Uh, send our greetings to the Citibank group and your family. I uh, thank them for giving you 